Welcome to Conversations. I'm Mukhtadar Khan, your host, and today I'm going to talk to you about geopolitics in general. What is geopolitics? Consider this as Geopolitics 101, a basic discussion of what is geopolitics, uh, how is it different from world politics or international relations or American foreign policy or comparative foreign policy. So these are some of this discussion will be academic. I will try to strip it off uh, academic paraphernalia so that it is easy to understand uh, and uh, basically focus on what is entail when we say that we are looking at it from a geopolitical perspective uh, and what geopolitics is all about. So, but before that, please subscribe to Conversations, like this video, press the bell icon and don't forget to share this video with your friends and your social political network. And if you would like to support Conversations, you can also become a member of Conversations. The button to become a member, which is join, J-O-I-N, is right next to the button to subscribe. So let's begin. The, the definition is very simple, that when politics is impacted by geography, which means that the terrain, the geographical conditions, uh, and now increasingly environmental conditions to some extent, if they have a bearing on politics, then that politics becomes geopolitics. So broadly speaking, we think of politics as two kinds of politics, domestic politics and what is called as high politics or foreign affairs or international affairs or relations between great powers or foreign policy. Uh, and now increasingly in this era, geoeconomics, uh, where we are talking about how geopolitics can be affected by economic uh, conditions. So because we live in an era of nation states, which historians date to the Westphalian Treaty, but uh, I think that it is meaningless to talk about uh, international relations uh, or world politics as relations between nation state. Uh, even during the colonial era, those were empires. There was the British Empire, the French Empire, the German Empire, the Russian, the Ottoman Empire. So mostly after the end of World War I and the process of decolonization in the 1960s and 70s, we now have about 200 plus nation states. So we are truly in an, living in a world composed of nation states uh, and therefore the world the nature of world politics today is international relations. So we, we look at the relations between these units of uh, global politics, which are states. Uh, we can look at it uh, in terms of really thought, which is essentially about balance of power. We can look at it from neoliberal perspective, where we look at international trade. We also look at it from a perspective of globalization. Uh, we may also look at it uh, from a very sociological perspective, which is movement of people, migration, uh, refugees, and we can also look at it from uh, econ um, environmental perspective, the impact of, uh, for example, uh, rainfall, flooding, etc., uh, global warming on, on politics, really. Uh, so, so there are many ways of thinking about it, but when geography begins to matter, then it becomes geopolitics. And the most important aspect of geography is borders. So the key element of every geopolitical discussion is borders, territory, territories, uh, the exercise of sovereignty, interventions. Uh, so for example, these days uh, for India, uh, India's most of India's politics is geopolitical because it's worried about China's incursions into India along uh, its border, uh, violation of India's territorial borders, either in, in Galwan area, in Ladakh or near Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, on the other side, India is again worried about infiltration across the border from Pakistan, people coming in and causing, uh, adding fuel to fire uh, with the Kashmir situation. And even now with Bangladesh, uh, uh, like I said in one of my previous conversations, 94% of 
uh, Bangladesh border is with India. So India completely surrounds. So India's relations with Bangladesh are also around the border sharing of water and, and refugees and migration and cross-border trade. So it becomes purely geopolitical. Uh, so, so in that sense, a large chunk of uh, uh, international affairs uh, and international relations uh, is about geopolitics because about maintaining borders, maintaining independence, uh, and mostly geopolitics is something that fascinates people who are from the realist perspective, who are looking at balance of power uh, and military uh, use of force. Uh, so that is something that you have to understand. So when we look at, for example, when India uh, looks at uh, China, it sees China on its border, and then it says, oh my God, it's a country of one billion people, its economy is five times bigger than ours, it's a nuclear power, and it has an aggressive uh, foreign policy. So so the geopolitics is of India is dominated by the power of China. Uh, sometimes, for example, uh, these days, uh, the biggest uh, global political issue is uh, encapsulated in the concept of Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States. But what is Indo-Pacific? Indo-Pacific is an area of world politics that includes the two oceans, so from the Indian Ocean all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So we are looking at the western border of the United States and all the way to the Middle East. So we're looking at this as an important area, more than now more than 50% of uh, global trade comes from here. Uh, if you look at uh, India, Japan, uh, US as part of an Indo-Pacific power and China, so some of the uh, four of the biggest economies out of five, I mean, except Germany, all the major economies are in the Indo-Pacific region. But suddenly this is the most important part of the world. Until recently, it was the Atlantic, uh, both sides of the Atlantic, the, the Euro-Atlantic, US and Europe. But now it's all in the Pacific. That's a geographical way of thinking. Uh, but what does it tell you? So, for example, if you're thinking more of uh, Eurasia and Europe, you're looking at the continent of Europe and the politics of that. So you 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 think in terms of exercising military force, unless you're the United States, uh, from a land power perspective. So suddenly, the biggest threat uh, to the uh, European region is a land power like Russia. But if you're looking at the Indo-Pacific region and you're looking at the geopolitics of this region because it's about oceans, what you need to focus on is navies. So that's why the United States is such an important player in the region because it has, uh, it, until recently, it had the biggest blue water navy and the capacity to project power all over the planet. So the United States has a huge na navy and it has a strong naval presence uh, in Japan. Taiwan uh, and uh, unofficially even India is providing some kind of basis for US Navy. And then of course, China has now uh, rapidly built its Navy. So all the action that you see in the Indo-Pacific is around sea power. Uh, if you look at historically, and by history, history, I don't mean going all the way back to Greece. Uh, well, if you did go back to Greece, you will realize that uh, Greece was the only power like the US. Greece was both a sea power and a land power. So if you are reading about uh, the battle between Athens uh, and, and Troy, etc., the early battles uh, with regards to Helena of Troy, it's all about navies and ships and islands and the Greek islands. Uh, but then if you look at the era of Alexander the Great, it was a land power. He just went across uh, the Eurasian region or came all the way to India. Uh, but today, if you look uh, today, if you look, uh, the major powers in the world, uh, like Russia and China, are land powers. Russia, China is building rapidly a navy, so it's quite possible that in another five, six years, it will be both a land and sea power. Uh, Germany is primarily a land power, as is France. Uh, Britain has always been a sea power. The U.S. is both, in fact, the U.S. is air power, sea power, land power, and now with uh, its uh, space force, it's also 
uh, a space power. So it's essentially your capacity to project force uh, in various geographical settings. Uh, and so, so, so that is how we start thinking uh, when we are thinking in geopolitically capacity to, to project power. The geography also plays a lot of role in how you define your national security and how you defend yourself. So consider the United States. The U.S. is like a veritable fort. So if you look at the U.S., it's like a fort with two moats. Uh, you have uh, the Pacific Ocean on one side and you have the Atlantic Ocean on the other side. And then you have Canada in the north and Mexico in the south who are not really great powers. So the United States is not immediately threatened uh, because of these two oceans. I mean, uh, I think uh, American football teams should be able to take Canada and Mexico is not really a threat in the military sense. Uh, I mean, there is a lot of threat in terms of drugs and migration. It's uh, it's it's like a bridge to to South America, and in that sense, it does threaten U.S. border and U.S. Uh, 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 territorial integrity. No one is stealing land, but there are a lot of people coming across the border, which some people feel as if it's an invasion. But otherwise, it's impossible to. To invade. Imagine China trying to attack the United States, and we saw uh, how difficult it was. All Japan could do uh, was attack Hawaii and during World War One or World War Two. There were hardly any attacks on the U.S. proper. Uh, so the U.S. is like a fort. So that, that is how you look at the geography, and suddenly you realize that oh my God, this is one of the world's biggest natural forts. That's a geopolitical assessment of U.S. defense capabilities. But if you're looking at India, for example, and you say, okay, if you, there are only two ways in which you can actually, well, you can actually invade India by land as well as by sea. And India has been invaded many times by land, even though India has the Himalayas uh, as kind of a border that protects it. Uh, there are uh, passages which have allowed India to be invaded from the north. India has not really been invaded by the sea so far ever, even though it, it has a long uh, coastline. So for India to actually make India territorially safe, you need <laughs> an army that can protect its borders in the north, an army capable of fighting in very high, uh, uh, at a very high level height uh, in the mountains, uh, in very cold weather, and also a navy that can protect its uh, vast coastline. Uh, and so this is what we mean uh, when we look at uh, geopolitically. In the modern era, the, the, the sea powers, primarily the United States, Great Britain, and Japan, uh, it's not a major power now. It's still one of the top five or six more powerful countries. But in World War II and before that, it was a major sea power. Uh, and then you, in land powers, you had the Ottomans, the Mongols, the Mughals, the Persians, the Iranians, the Arabs, the Germans, the Russians. These were all <laughs> uh, land powers uh, based on gunpowder with its cannons and cavalry and uh, in the modern era, motorized uh, guns, tanks, etc. World War II was primarily fought first in the land, and after the entry of U.S., uh, then it became more of a sea. Even World War II was also a lot of land power, primarily because the main protagonist was Germany. Uh, so. That is what geopolitics is. It's, it's about power, it's about land, it's about geography, it's about territory, it's about sovereignty. Uh, and so we are often looking at very clearly the capacity of a state to project power or at least protect its borders and sovereignty. Now, there are some classics that I would recommend. From the classical era, you can read Sun Tzu, uh, The Art of Warfare, or Cautilia's Arthasastra. I have done reviews of Kautilya in both English and Hindi. You can search for it. Or you can read Thucydides, the Peloponnesian War. It's one of the, the biggest classics on geopolitics to some extent. Uh, and then in the modern era, of course, the, 
the fathers of geopolitics are Alfred Mahan and Alfred McKinder. And currently, John Mearsheimer is pretty dominant, at least <laughs> in social media. And of course, uh, uh, his books are also very critical. In the context of the U.S., he talks about when I when I mentioned the two modes, he says uh, one of the reasons why the U.S. is so safe is because of the incredible stopping power of water. <laughs> so you know you couldn't charge a fort because of the moat, and so you will have to build a very big navy if you want to invade the U.S. Um, so so we are living in, er in an era uh, where. Uh, with the end of the Soviet Union, we saw an end of geopolitics. Soviet Union, the Cold War was all about geopolitics. Uh, the communists were advancing in Africa, so the U.S. had to push back in Africa. The communists entered in Afghanistan. So you're looking at the map constantly. Where are the communists? Let's push them back. Where are the Americans? Where are the Europeans, etc.? And then with the end of the Cold War, we stopped looking at borders. We started talking about a borderless world. We were talking about as if geopolitics became irrelevant and globalization took over. So from 1991 onwards, it was all about globalization. We're creating a borderless world. We're creating one economy where all of us are integrated. But now we have come back to, to a sort of a new Cold War with China. Uh, we are deglobalizing and we are restructuring uh, supply chains. We are talking about French shoring. And once again, borders and geography have suddenly become very important uh, and so geopolitics is back. So as long as we see great power rivalry between the US and China, I think we will be talking a lot about geopolitics. So I hope that this small primer gave you an idea about what we mean when we talk about geopolitics. So when, uh, And that's why if you notice in many of my conversations, I use maps. Uh, I use maps to, to, to give you a, a spatial sense uh, of what's going on there, where are the forces, where are the troops, why is this particular uh, advancement important because uh, geography matters. So when geography matters in politics, it's geopolitics. So I hope you found this interesting. So subscribe to Conversations, like this video, press the bell icon. Don't forget to share this video with your sociopolitical network. If you are a professor and if you use this in a class, do just let me know. Uh, I just would love to have conversations. A lot of people are actually beginning to cite conversations uh, in academics. So on my Google Scholar, I do see now citations of various videos. Uh, but if you are using it in your classroom, do let me know. Uh, it will give me more, shall we say, encouragement to do more of such conceptual videos. So take care. Until next time, I'm your host, Muqtadar Khan.